Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Michael Ayala in tonight for Vinnie Politan and we begin tonight in Portland, Oregon, where romance author Nancy Brophy is on trial for the murder of her husband Dan. On June 2nd, 2018, the body of Dan Brophy was discovered at the Oregon Culinary Institute where he taught. Now he had been shot twice, once in the back and then once in the chest. Now today Dan's father testified for the state and painted a picture of what Dan Brophy was like for this jury. Take a listen. Do live life by example. Okay. Did you ever get a chance to work with Dan? Oh yeah. I mean, in what respect? Well, that's what I'm asking. In what capacities did you get to chance get the chance to work with Dan? Oh, mostly as he's older and married in his at his house, in his yard, in his garage, in his house. Okay. So helping him out around the house, doing things around the house. Trying to. You know, if you can make sense of the mayhem he lived with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've heard a little bit about his garden and, and the chickens and the garage and stuff. Uh, would you categorize that as mayhem? Mayhem in big time. Okay. Did it seem to make sense to Dan, though? Oh, yeah. None of it was a problem. Yeah. I think it's genetic, I decided. Uh Karen's dad was very much that way. I'd try and straighten out his shop or tools, and then it disintegrated. Same is true with Dan. I spent years trying to get his shop and tools and stuff in order, with to no avail. And then his mother has pretty much the same problem. <laughs> Was Dan much into the tools in the shop, or was he more interested in the gardening? And uh, more interested in the garden. He was interested in the tools, but he spent his life looking for them. <laughs> uh, in your opinion, did you, when looking at Dan and his work ethic, or just uh, you know the amount that he was working, did you think that he worked a lot? Oh, he worked a lot. He worked all the time. Okay. And, be, and not just at work, you know, where he's employed, but around the house, too. Was he always busy? Depends on what his interest level was at that given time. The chip, chickens were top, top priority. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae is joining us now live from Portland, Oregon. All right, Julia, great to see you. D tell us more about Dan's father's testimony. He was an interesting character. Um, funny guy, but clearly deadpan. I don't think he meant to be funny at all, but he was an interesting guy on the stand. He really was, and he was engaging with this jury. They were chuckling along with the comments that he made, uh, saying Dan's debris, the clutter that he said his son had that was genetic, and there was even a moment where he uh, talked about it being from the mom's side of the family, Karen Brophy. We also heard testify twice now. Uh, that was a moment between these jurors and Karen. They looked over to the mother of the victim as she's being described on the stand by the victim's father as someone who may have that messy gene as well so he really did a good job of connecting with them but he also highlighted some things that this prosecution wants to share with this jury about motive he talked about uh, what financial troubles this couple may have been in and what he understood about them from his vantage point take a listen Barry what do you mean by that yes how quickly yeah. very quickly within a couple of days or like a couple of weeks uh, less than weeks. Less than weeks? Yes. What about those chickens? Did she get rid of those? Yeah, she got rid of those quite fast. We was amazed how that could happen so fast without having chickens, too. Take me a second there. <laughs> they had bought a Prius, and Nancy was basically using that, and then... Somewhere down the line, it disappeared. Okay, I want and to there, talk, oh, sorry. There was only one vehicle, and so at that point, we, we gave them the van, and there was only one stipulation on it, and that was that she changed the title. 
He said that they loan the couple $50,000 to start their own venture, and then they only got about a quarter of it back. They eventually just told the couple it was fine. They knew they weren't going to pay it back. He also talked about the different bedrooms he believed they stayed in. He said that debris, that clutter that he knew was indicative of his son, he started to see it in the downstairs bedroom, which made him believe that the wife was sleeping upstairs while the husband was sleeping downstairs. Yeah, all in all, Julia, a very effective witness, I thought, for the state. Gave them a lot of good information, gave life to the victim here. Really good stuff there. Now, um, Karen Brophy, Dan's mother, she was recalled today. She had been on the stand earlier, um, had some problems with memory, but did fine. What did she have to say when she took the stand again? She was called again to now talk about a different portion of this case. Yesterday, she testified really focusing on how Nancy Brophy informed her about what happened to Dan Brophy. Today, it was more about the conversations that she may have had with Nancy on a larger sense before the death of Dan Brophy. Take a listen to how she said Nancy Brophy may have been complaining a bit about her husband. And Nancy said uh, to me, and she had three, about three times that year that Dan had changed. But um, on the third time, I, he, she said to me, all he wants to do is lie on the couch and watch sports. That was not like Dan. It really wasn't. And... Um, Rephrase the question, please. Well, that's okay. Um, and I, I, it's sort of been a build off what you're talking about. Um, when she said that he just liked to lay on the couch and watch sports, you said that wasn't like Dan. That wasn't Meaning like Dan. Meaning you didn't believe her or that you thought... Or you what I said her. to her was, I knew he was working two jobs. And I said to her, you know, he's over 60. I said, maybe he's just tired, Nancy. And I don't remember how she answered me. Like you said, Michael, these are small nuggets, which by themselves wouldn't mean much. A wife talking about her husband not doing more around the house. But because it all builds towards what the prosecution is telling this jury about motive, that she was unhappy with the way things were at home. And both of these parents also said something that the jury was taking note of, writing notes that we could see about the fact that he didn't have a gun, that he hated guns, essentially. Uh, so they were surprised to learn that Nancy, along with Dan, had purchased a gun before the death. Yeah, that relationship stuff really interesting as well, because one of the things I think the defense has been hinting at is that there was no acrimony in the relationship, that she always spoke well of him, and things were going fairly well for a couple of their age. And um, finally, Julia, uh, the defense hinted, uh, finally, I've been waiting for this, at some other possible suspects. How did that sort of come about today in court? You know, they're obviously denying that this was Nancy Brophy, and they don't have any uh, requirement to offer another suspect. We know jurors want to know if you're saying this isn't the person who did it, this man who was a beloved chef, someone who was well-respected in his field, being killed inside of a place that was not easy to get into. So on cross-examination, we heard from two of the managers of that Culinary Institute. They were asked on cross-examination specifically about the population outside of that school and who may have had access. Take a look. And, and why did you worry that, that this, a student could be the shooter? We had um, a lot of students who were ex-military who had come to school on the GI Bill, uh, some of which had had multiple combat tours in uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, and some of them suffered from PTSD. I want to shift gears for just a little bit and ask you about um, live fire. You talked about the fact that this was um, a big deal for the students. Is that right? That's correct. Was it also a pretty stressful, a high stress day for students? Absolutely. Would it be fair to say there was a lot of traffic kind of around the school in terms of people, not actual cars? 
yes, especially during the day when the, the Lincoln High was in session. Those students would always be around, especially during the lunch 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 time for them. And what about other populations, transient populations, camps, things like that over the years? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes there were. There uh, was a specific area uh, close to the Lincoln High School bleachers where uh, a couple of different groups over a few, a few summers would hang out there in the, in the good weather. Sure. Did you ever have any problems? Like, with, did the school have problems or any individual employees with the school? No. Um, and specifically, we've heard and seen some testimony about there being an administration building that is separate from the culinary building. Is that Correct. right? Would you ever have any issues with people having to walk back and forth between those buildings? Uh, what do you mean issues? I mean... Like with people walking through transients in the area? No, not necessarily. Not, not really. They were always fairly... No, Brian Wilkie there, he was the CEO of OCI, and he said that that really wasn't a problem. He only once had an issue with a student who went into another student's locker, but it's beginning to be a theme on cross-examination. These jurors were also shown a layout of this school, it's something that seems that it wouldn't be easy for someone who wasn't familiar with the layout to be able to get through. This is first an exhibit recreation that we did of where Dan Brophy's body was found by investigators in Kitchen One. And then when you look at the entire layout of this school, you see that there were three different kitchens, there were many hallways, and the red that you see, the red entrances, those are all the different doors that uh, one of the employees on the stand today said that those doors automatically locked, and when someone unlocked the main one, they all unlocked. That was just the automatic way that it went. All right, Julia Janae, thank you so much for that report. Truly appreciate it as always. I'll let you go now. I want to bring in my think tank. Joining us tonight in the Bronx, New York, criminal defense attorney Renee Hill. In Houston, Texas, criminal defense attorney Carmen Rowe. And in Orlando, Florida, criminal defense attorney Kyla Coleman. Everyone, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Truly appreciate you taking out the time to be with me. Um, I want to start off with you, Carmen, and talk a little bit about what we're seeing happening now with the state's case. I think it's, it's, I think they're trying a fantastic case, a lot of circumstantial evidence, but they're piling little nuggets, as Julia said, on top of each other. And I think they're painting a very strong picture that this is someone who had motive, opportunity, and the knowledge to commit this crime. Michael, I couldn't agree more. I think they're doing a fantastic job, but I think they're pushing a lot on motive and less on how we're going to connect this individual to this crime. And I think it's critical that the defense is creating an alternate suspect that may be out there because the jury's going to ask, if not her, then who? And so this is, you know, a situation where we have a significant prosecution case, but you have a lot of questions that are out there that this jury is going to want to know answers to. And so while we can put the victim out there as this tremendous person, there's still a lot of questions left on the table. So they're going to have to work to get where they want to get to by the time we get to verdict. You know, Renee, the father painted a very nice picture on the stand of Dan. He was an engaging fellow, certainly credible in, in every way, talking about different things, perhaps these financial troubles, some, some problems in, or what might be problems in the relationship, maybe a growing sort of rift between the two. Um, but again, those are things that as you move on in a relationship, not necessarily odd, but again, when you put it total together with all the circumstantial evidence, it can be pretty strong. It can be very strong for the prosecution. Like you said, those building blocks is what the prosecution is going to depend upon to make their case here. But again, like Carmen said, there are uh, issues here that the prosecution is going to have to deal with because the defense is doing a good job with their cross-examination. And they are putting out there into the minds of the jurors that, you know, you had to have the access to this location and you had to know the layout in order to get to Mr. Brophy. So it gives light that this may have been someone who only could have access and know that information and that the wife is not that person. So the prosecution is definitely going to have to deal with that. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it could be that person. I mean, she's someone who was familiar with the school, so that may work in their favor as well as far as the state is concerned. Kyla, m my thing is, you know, up to this point, I was wondering if the, sta uh, the defense was going to actually provide um, this alternate theory of some sort. Because the, the question that I keep having about this, if, if it wasn't, uh, the defendant, then who would have wanted to kill this guy? We're not hearing anything about him that suggests someone might want to kill him. They're starting to suggest these other possibilities. How important is that in a defense's case in a case like this? Oh, yeah, it's super important because if you're going to put the blame on someone else or point the finger somewhere else, you have to make it make sense for a jury. Jurors are looking for things that tie pieces of evidence together that just make sense. So if you say, hey, it might have been a transient person that came through or it might have been a student that had PTSD and snapped, then that might make a jury believe, OK, it might not have been his wife, especially if they had a loving relationship for all of these years. The one thing that's been getting to me, though, is the way that the defense may play away at her having a gun and her being an author and having that gun for purposes of research and writing another novel. So I'm really, I want to, I want to delve into that a little bit more and hear that theory of defense. Well, of course she is going to take the stand. So she'll have to ex explain for herself why she bought that gun. There was some uh, explanation in opening statements that she bought it after the, uh, the shooting at uh, uh, Marjorie Stoneman High School, that, that school massacre, she bought it for protection. There was some mention of that in opening statements, but again, she'll take the stand and have to explain it herself.